I said there are a bunch of kids in the room that aren't normally in the room. We normally have some kids in the room, but not all the little ones. But today we brought them in, and my first, I have a message just for kids. So if you hear the word kid and you think that's me, this is the time. You've got to pay attention, okay? You got, this is the time that you have to listen. This season is called Advent in the church calendar. And Advent is a time of looking forward to Christmas. Anybody look forward to Christmas? All of you. Yes. All right. Adults, too. You are welcome to look forward to Christmas. I had a friend in college, and she said when she was younger, Christmas was so exciting that the holiday of Christmas and Christmas Eve wasn't enough. So she named December 23rd Christmas Soon. And then she added an extra holiday. December 23rd is Christmas Soon. That's Advent. It's Christmas Soon. It's, it's like looking forward to Christ's coming and being excited about that as people of faith. But... If you've been with us on Sunday mornings, we're not just an Advent, we are also closing out the book of Genesis. And if you know your Bible, that leads into the Exodus story. So, this morning we're going to look at those two things side by side, the Exodus and Advent. The story of Genesis that we've been looking at really began with a guy named Abraham. Kids, you have heard of, heard of Abraham? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, before that, I've got one thing that you got, I want you guys to, to be able to say at the end of this, all right? One point for the kiddos, and it's pretty simple. You ready? God has been faithful. Can you say that out loud with me? God has been faithful. Nailed it. All right, you got it. So we're going to start with Abraham. God calls Abraham, and not by any merit of Abraham. He's not really good, and so God calls him. He's just a guy. And God calls him, and he tells him, Abraham, go to the land that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to, through you, I'm going to bless the whole world. Everybody's going to be blessed through you and your descendants. And Abraham has a son named Isaac. And Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons, and one of them's name is Joseph. And Joseph gets separated from the rest of his family and sold into slavery down in Egypt. You guys remember these stories? And while he's there, he ends up becoming the second most powerful person in the whole country. And he's in charge of everything, which is really good because there's a famine that comes, which means there's no food. And through God's wisdom, Joseph prepared and saved food so that people could eat even when the food wouldn't grow. Well, his family that he'd been separated from heard about this, and they decide to go down to Egypt so they can eat as well. But before they leave, Joseph's dad, his name is Jacob, stops to talk to God to make sure that he should leave the land that was promised to him. And here's what God tells him in Genesis 46, verse 3 and 4. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I, that's God, will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. God tells Jacob, it's okay, you can go, and I will be with you. I will be faithful to you, and I will bring you back out. And guess what? That's what happens. We saw it last week. Jacob goes down, he grows old, and he dies in Egypt, and he's brought back out, and he's buried in the promised land, just as God promised him that he would be. And God was faithful to Jacob. Not only that, the nation starts to grow. That's where we ended last week. Going forward, we're looking at the Exodus story. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, it tells you that, that the nation of Israel grew. And there were, this small family became a great nation. And God was faithful again. He was faithful in that He promised to Abraham that He would make him a great nation. He promised to Isaac that they would grow and be a great nation. He promised it to Jacob, and now here we are with once a small family grown into a great nation. And God was faithful again. But, you always got to be scared when there's a but, right, kids? You know that, right? You did good, but, okay, you always got to be patient. But there's a new problem. The very next verse in the book of Exodus tells you that there was a new king in Egypt who didn't know about Joseph. And that king did not like God's people and he wasn't kind to them, and he made them his slaves, and he forced them to work. It was not a good time for God's people. It was very, very hard. And even in the midst of that, God's people knew that they had a promise. How? God had already told this to Abraham. Chapter 15, verses 13 to 14, this is a paraphrase of that, those verses. 
God said to Abram, Know this, your descendants will live as outsiders in a land not theirs. They'll be enslaved and beaten down for 400 years. Then I will punish their slave masters and your offspring will march out of there loaded with plunder. So God's people have a promise. Even in the midst of their hurts, that God is going to rescue them. And in the beginning of Exodus, we start to see that plan unfold with the person of Moses. God calls Moses through the burning bush. Do you guys remember this? Lots of stories today. You remember this story? And he calls out to him. And in Exodus 3, verse 7, again, paraphrasing, he tells them, I have heard my people's afflictions. I have seen their pain, and I know their sufferings, and I will be with them. I will deliver them, and I will be with them. And through Moses, God brings about the ten plagues and the Red Sea, and He leads His people out of Egypt to worship Him. And God was faithful again. But this morning, that's the Exodus story. I don't want to stop with the Exodus. What did I tell you this was the season of at the beginning? Were you listening? Not quite. Not Christmas. Looking forward to Christmas. It's also, oh yeah, Advent. There you go. Who's listening in the back? Way to go. All right. Advent. So, this isn't just a story about the Exodus. This is a story about Advent. A couple thousand years later, God's people were enslaved again. This time they were enslaved to Egyptians. They were enslaved to sin. And once again, God heard their cries. And God knew that they could not break off the yoke of their slave masters on their own. And once again, God said, I will be with you. And that's what we look forward to in the season of Christmas. God saying, I will be with you. And doing so by becoming flesh and the person of Jesus Christ. And God becomes a human to save us and in Matthew chapter 1, it tells us the same language that it uses in Exodus 3. You shall name his name Emmanuel, which means what? God is with us. God was with us in Jesus Christ. And the same way that God was with Abraham, the same way that God was with Isaac, was with Jacob, with Joseph, with his people through the Exodus, and with you now, God has been faithful. Now, if you've been here for a while, you've heard me say at some point that as a pastor, it's not a, a sermon until you go from a truth to how that truth applies to your life. So this is the last thing I have for you, and it's really, really simple. God has been faithful, and you can trust Him to be faithful in your life. He has been faithful in the past, and you can trust Him to be faithful to you now. Kids, you did a pretty good job. If you are in a, is it preschool? We just call it preschool or nursery. You guys can be dismissed to the back. Who's, who are the teachers this, this morning? Caleb and Maddie. So you guys can follow Caleb and Maddie out. What about nursery? Are they taking nursery kiddos as well? You did a good job, kids. We, uh, we'll have you back in here next week. For those of you remaining, if you have a Bible, Exodus chapter 3 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the chair in front of you if you're using one of those. Page 46 this morning. My goal for the remainder of our time, and how am I doing on time? Where did my... Oh, hey, right there it is. 11 o'clock. Oh, I'm, I'm great on time. My goal for the remainder of our time 
is to expound on what you just heard in a kid's message. And although it has that, that those air quotes around it, because it, it may have been a kid's message in terms of length and vocabulary, but definitely not in content, right? Returning to the faithfulness of God, there's nothing adolescent about that. That is a truth that people of great spiritual maturity need over and over and over again in their lives. So, Exodus chapter 3, we have just a couple verses I want to look at as we really are contemplating the whole Exodus narrative. Exodus 3, verses 7 and 8. Excuse me, 7, 8, and 9. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we... Uh, briefly recount stories of your faithfulness, Lord. I pray that we would find greater trust and uh, confidence in who you are. That the promises that have been made to us and your Son, Christ, are true, are going to be fulfilled in, in their entirety in our lives. We don't deserve these great gifts that you've lavished upon us, and yet here we stand. Thank you, Lord. Would you guide our thoughts this morning? And I pray that as we have the young children in the room, that those truths take deep root in their lives. That our kids would find you, Lord. They would find great value in being people of you and people who follow after you and and continue and to chase after your faithfulness in their lives, even when it's difficult. We pray that you would call them out of their sinfulness and turn towards you the way that you've done us, Lord. We're so grateful to be your children. In your name we pray, amen. Um, so as I said earlier, we're going to really expound on what you just heard in the kids' message, but... We're, we're really going to arrive at communion this morning. It is the first of the month. We do that every Sunday on the first of the month. So that's going to be the landing place eventually. But to get there, we're going to take a probably not the most direct route or the most common, but maybe one we should connect more often, um, through the Exodus narrative. And if you've been with us on Sunday mornings for the months preceding, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and, and the Exodus story flows so directly out of the narrative of Genesis, it is just assumed that you read one after you finish the first. If you get, pick up the, the narrative in Exodus, the verse that I showed you earlier, in uh, Exodus 1 verse 8, it just says, and, and a Pharaoh came along who didn't know Joseph. It, it's just assuming that you just finished Genesis chapter 50 and know all about who Joseph was. So there's an expectation here and really... Uh, a completion that we should at least touch on this narrative. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. As, as the exodus flows out of the, the narrative of Genesis that we've gone through. And you heard the story. Joseph had saved all of his people through God's wisdom that was given to him. They uh, don't die through a famine but are saved. They move down to the land of Egypt and they become a great nation. But then the Egyptians start to fear them. There's too many of those people. We, we got we to gotta beat them down a little bit because they might become too powerful and overtake us. And the backdrop of the Exodus is the hard labor of slavery in Egypt. Taskmasters who despise God's people. 
suffering under the thumb of the powerful pharaohs for hundreds of years. I told you this, uh, the title of this, if you caught it at the beginning, was The Exodus and Advent. And that's really the same story when we compare it to the Advent narrative. The language, in fact, is very similar. I've got a verse to throw up on the, on the screen here. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Can you hear the language of, of the Exodus there? The, the groaning? If not, I think I have the... the Verse we just read in Exodus up there as well. I have seen their afflictions. I have heard their cries. I know their suffering. Paul's description in Romans chapter 8 of, of the burden of slavery to sin is eerily similar to what happens in God's people in Exodus chapters 1, 2, and 3. They're suffering under the burden. They're enslaved. They're calling out to God. It's the same story. One is a literal slavery. The second is spiritual slavery. Both begging God to relieve them from the burden of their oppressors. We cannot do this on our own. A few weeks ago I pointed out to you that the uh, dialogue that Jacob has in Exodus, or excuse me, Genesis 46 before he goes down to Egypt is the last we hear from the voice of God until Moses in Exodus 3. There's a 400-year gap between those two things. Quite similarly, at the end of the book of Malachi, before Christ comes, there is another 400-year gap in between. The Bible is thematically tying these two things together for you to intentionally call back the same way that God was faithful then, He is faithful now. He heard your cries, O people in slavery. He knew your burden and your hardship. He's not aloof or apathetic towards your pain. He heard you and He will be with you. Both of these problems that have the same backdrop also find incredibly similar resolution. Moses goes to Pharaoh and he tells him what? Let my people go. It's not the end of the sentence, by the way, and, and we'll get to this in the next couple weeks. He's not just telling Pharaoh to let the people go. There's a reason attached to it. So that they may go and worship God. Let my people go. And what does Pharaoh say? Come on, kids. You're still, you know, the kids who are still here, what does Pharaoh say? No. Over and over and over again. Let my people go. No. And you know the story. God tells the ruler of the world, you need to let my people go so that they can worship me. And he defiantly shakes his fist at God and says, you're not more powerful than I am. At which point God unleashes the heavens and says, let me just show you how wrong you are. One piece at a time. Right? It's that old Johnny Cash song. No, it's not that. Sorry. That, that's not in the notes. That just came out. I don't know how. Do you guys know that song? It's, no. If not, go listen. Johnny Cash. You should go listen to Johnny Cash every once in a while. He, ta he works at a car factory and he takes the... He, he works there for 30 years and he takes his car one piece at a time and he puts it all together at the end, you know. Oh, never mind. Okay. It's 
It's okay, one piece at a time. Just let, yeah, grab the guitar. Let's do it, Gordon. <laughs> Maybe next Sunday. Um, one piece at a time. God starts to break Pharaoh's idea that he is in control of everything. Starts with water into blood. Let my people go. No. Pharaoh, let me tell you, bad things are coming if you continue to refuse this. And the water turns the blood, and Pharaoh is still defiant. Next come frogs. Pharaoh, still defiant. Then gnats, then flies, then the livestock die, then boils, then hail, locusts, and darkness, and Pharaoh is still defiant. I rule the most powerful nation in the world. You are not going to tell me what to do. But you know the story. What happens at the end? The Passover. God tells the nation of Israel, I'm going to strike down the firstborn in every household. Unless, what are you to do? You need to take a perfect lamb and to sacrifice that lamb. And you take the blood of the lamb and you cover both posts of your door and the header. And, and when the angel of the Lord comes in the night and it comes to your door, it will pass over you because of the blood of the lamb. The wrath of God that is poured out on Egypt does not strike the Israelites who faithfully cover their door in the blood of the Lamb, not because of any merit of the people in the home, not because they were lucky, not because the firstborn in those homes were, were more righteous, not by an accident of geography, not because of their confidence in their rituals. The Spirit of God passes over them based on one thing and one thing alone, the blood of the Lamb. the same conclusion with Advent, is it not? Christ comes to break the will of sin, the, the, the grip that death and darkness has over our lives. The same way that Pharaoh refused to let go of God's people, sin grips onto you and will not let go until the final decisive blow is dealt and the sacrificial lamb sheds his blood so that your life can be covered. So that the wrath of God may pass over you, not by any merit of your own, not by any accident of geography, not because you followed the ritual properly, because the blood of the lamb. God has been faithful. We stand before a righteous God, entirely unrighteous, sinful to our core, but God became flesh for us to be with us, to die for us, to cover our unworthy lives with the blood of the Savior, and the wrath of God passes over once again. He was faithful in the Exodus. He was faithful to become flesh in Christ. And He is faithful to forgive our sins. This is why we have to have an entire season just looking forward to the moment when God becomes flesh to be with us. It's Christmas soon. I can't get enough of Christ He is faithful. We celebrate in Advent the faithfulness of God to hear our concerns and respond. We have called out just like the people in the Exodus. And God says, I have heard. I know your sufferings. I've seen the oppression. I know the difficulty in your lives. I'm not leaving you alone. 
He is not some distant benefactor who writes a check so you will stop pestering him. He becomes flesh to be with you. Take on your burdens with you. He himself becomes flesh for us. In the Advent season, we have on full display the great truths of God's faithfulness, do we not? He entered into our broken plight to free us from our bondage to sin, to offer hope in the midst of suffering and slavery. There's a CDC study that came out this week. It showed that for the second time, two years in a row, excuse me, first time this has happened in modern American history, life expectancy in our country has gone down. Two years in a row. First time that's happened in modern American history. And the study offered two primary reasons why. First was opioid overdose. Second was increase in suicide rate. Our world is dying literally for hope. Looking for some kind of purpose or reason under the burden and bondage of sin, seeing no out to this life. There's nothing of value here. I don't have any purpose. There's nothing to keep me going. I might as well just live it at the end of a needle or just end it right now. There's nothing worth living for. It's a crisis of hope. And if you sit here today feeling like there is no hope in your life, I have great news for you. I have great news for you. Christ is God with us. He has heard your burdens. He knows your pain. He knows the struggles of your life. And He entered into our broken plight to free us from the bondage of sin, whatever that sin may be. Bitterness, addiction, pride, greed, laziness, vanity, selfishness. Fill in the blank. It does not matter. Whatever vice has a hold of your life that you just feel like it, it just you can't get over it. God became flesh to be with us, to live for us, to die for us, to cover our broken lives in the blood of the Lamb. To save us from that sinful life. There is hope. There is great news. Christ took on flesh to die to free you from your sin. And by faith you can follow Him. And if you sit here today... And you're inside, your spirit can hardly contain the joy at hearing that great truth spoken again out loud. The gospel story told anew. Then you have a great mandate to take that message to others. To never let that story fall from your lips. That there is hope in the midst of hopelessness. That God has come for us. That God has been faithful and you can trust Him to be faithful again. He has saved His people before. He can save us now if you will place your faith in Him. If you have already done that, it is your duty to take that message everywhere you go. And if you have not done that, it is my great joy to offer you that message this morning. By faith in Christ, you can be made new in Him.